Hello there. My name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. The subject for discussion here is arguably the most productive shore angling trip in sea angling history. And if that sounds like a bold claim, to add a bit of credibility to the proceedings, let me first throw in a few statistics. Fifteen thousand pounds of fish between ten anglers over six days. Eighty individual fish in excess of a hundred pounds. Seven fish topping two hundred pounds. And one absolute monster just falling short of three hundred pounds. On top of this, there was also a couple of individual angler catches of around fifteen hundred pounds in the day. And making that headline figure of fifteen thousand pounds even more staggering is the fact that for a variety of reasons, not everybody bothered to fish on each of the six days, myself included. Otherwise, the final stats would have been even more impressive than they currently are. Looking back for a moment to the glory days of offshore West Country wreck fishing with legendary boat skippers such as J.J. McVicker, Benny Passmore and John Trust, a thousand pounds of fish spread across a party of ten to twelve boat anglers would have made the angling headlines, which makes catching an average of two and a half times that figure on six consecutive days and from an open beach, even more mind-blowing. Accompanying the group on that trip was Dave Lewis, whose office I'm sat in here today. It was Dave who did the initial field work which spawned both this and subsequent visits. So as the man responsible for opening up this venue to UK visitors, tell us where exactly these particular beaches are, and how you came to get involved in that early exploratory expedition, which ultimately helped set things up for the rest of us. Namibia started in 97 or 98, and it was actually Clive Gammon who tracked down the guide Johan Berger, who ultimately we fished with and became probably the most famous guide operating on the Skeleton Coast down there. This was in the very early days of the internet and googling and using search engines to track things down, but we'd seen a, a bit of video footage at one of the angling shows that was showing people fishing on the skeleton coast catching these huge bronze whaler sharks and we got talking about it and as I say Clive ultimately went away and looked on the internet that was available then came up with Johan Berger swapped a few emails or faxes I think it was in those days back and forth and ultimately we went down there for 10 days fishing combined in Swakopmund on the Skeleton Coast and we spent some time in Cape Town, South Africa as well. Right from the very first day fishing it was it was astonishing just how good it was. Johan picked us up from the hotel, took us to the beach where we were going to fish. That day, if I remember rightly, it was about 10-20 miles north of Swakopmund. We caught some spotted gully sharks for bait. For those of you who don't know, I mean one of the main baits down there are the gills and liver from either a shark or a ray. And we were happy catching 30, 40 pound spotted gully sharks. But ultimately, Johan cut the gills out, cut the liver out, staked the carcass out on the surf line, cast out two huge baits. I don't really think Clive nor I expected too much to happen. But uh, Clive hooked the first fish after about half an hour, 40 minutes, which took about two and a half hours to land. I mean, Clive was in his 60s then. Fought the fish really, really hard, really well. It was a good two and a half hours. That fish was in excess of 250 pounds. I had the next one, which was a uh, average, 120, 150 pound. We had several more. Fish the following day, pretty similar results, but we also caught some of the edible species like the steam brass, cob, galloon and black tip that uh, you also catch on the surf there. And came away completely blown away by the destination. That trip had actually been, or the flights and the ground transfers and hotels for that trip had been put together by a lady called Annie Ayton who ran a company called Safari Plus, who at the time I was escorting groups of clients to key destinations for, and also looking at new destinations which had fishing potential. And 
I came home, I had a meeting with Annie, I said, look, this is going to be seriously good. I just knew that it was going to be something that uh, British anglers would really, really want to do. I've got to say, we weren't the first British anglers to fish down there. I, you know, I found out subsequently since that some of the guys who were involved in the international match scene had fished a, a competition in South Africa and then gone to the Skeleton Coast for a few days fishing and experienced it. So we weren't the first to go there, but uh, it was very much as a result of that trip and the features that appeared in Sea Angler magazine and various other publications that fueled what was truly an astonishing response to fish that destination. In the next seven or eight years, I did nine group trips back to Namibia. The results on some of those trips was absolutely staggering. We were fishing six days. We'd fly out on the Saturday evening from Heathrow. We'd arrive in Swakopmund midday on the Sunday and then fish Monday to Saturday inclusive, fly home the following Sunday. I say six full days fishing. The first two or three group trips were well over a 100 fish per group. Uh, we had several days where we were catching in excess of 40 sharks per day. The average size of the sharks was certainly around 150 pounds. It was unusual to catch a fish less than 100 pounds. I mean, an 80, 90 pounder was exceptional. Uh, as I say, most of them were, you know, well over the 100 pounds. We were seeing 200 pound plus fish on a daily basis and every trip the biggest of the week would be something approaching or just exceeding 300 pounds. And in the years since, you know, fish bigger than that have been caught. But as I said, the response was just staggering. I mean, we had waiting lists for places on the, on the trips. Everybody wanted to go there. As a result of that, some TV programs were filmed down there with different people who had series at the time. More magazine articles appeared. The demand was such that more and more people set up trips down there and the whole thing was going through a bit of a purple patch for at least a decade. I haven't been there myself for probably eight years now, I think it's seven or eight years since I was last in Namibia. I think it was about 2003 since the last trip. Numbers of fish had dropped off, although that particular trip, the weather wasn't particularly good. Like anywhere else in the world, you know, no, nowhere is guaranteed with good fishing. Uh, Namibia is as guaranteed as I think you'll get anywhere, but even there, you know, you do get problems with the weather. But the word on the grapevine talking to some of the locals was there'd been some increased activity offshore by Oriental longlining boats who were specifically after the fins, and they'd reduced the numbers of the fish. Other guides were put it down to climatic change. Whatever. People I've spoken to who have been there in the last few years come back and say that even though the numbers of the fish might have dropped a little bit from what we were catching in terms of quantity, the size of them seems to have gone up and a lot of three, four and even five hundred pound fish have been caught in more recent years. Yet the edible fishing is still very, very good down there. Lots of steam brass, lots of cob. Uh, steam brass is probably as close to a black bream is the nearest thing I can describe it to in the UK, but these things routinely go into double figures and £20 plus are certainly on the cards. And the cob is as close to a bass as you'll get in the UK. £20-£30, very much a small to average size one. Big ones, £50-£60, and the fish go up to figures approaching £100. Now, in terms of sheer weight, by a party of ten anglers fishing from a beach over six consecutive days, the visit we made back in 1999 is arguably the best shore fishing trip on record. Unless, of course, you know different. Now, I can clearly remember the trip that you came, Phil, and without a doubt, in terms of daily success rates and numbers and average size of the fish, that was, without a doubt, the most successful group trip that I personally took down there. Normally, in a six-day fishing week, I'd expect to have one fantastic day, two good days, two average days, one day when maybe you'd be struggling. 
the, the week you came down, everything we did worked, everywhere we went produced. I mean, the numbers of the fish were really quite staggering. I can remember we had the one, we were fishing in an area called Donkey Bay, and we had over 40 fish in one day. And when I say a day, it was like lunchtime by the time we got there, and we were away six, seven o'clock, so it's five, six hours fishing. One thing um, has just triggered my memory about Donkey Bay. The first few years we went there, Donkey Bay was the place. Johan would never take clients there on the first two or three days of a group trip. He wanted them to have the experience of catching fish before he went somewhere where they were going to hook big numbers. And um, Donkey Bay was one of those places. The reason the sharks were in Donkey Bay were high concentrations of mullet. They, they go in there and feed on the mullet. The mullet have all been taken out or the numbers severely reduced by netting. And the last couple of years I've been to Donkey Bay, nothing, not a single bronze whaler, which is a shame because it's also one of the easiest places you will ever fish. And for the benefit of those who know little or nothing about Namibia, can you also fill us in on some of the details about the place itself? Yeah, Namibia used to be a part of South Africa. It gained independence in 1990. It used to be called South West Africa. Back in the 19... 10, 1920, something like that. It used to be German Southwest Africa, but it was only German for a very short period. As I say, then it was administered by South Africa. Independence 1990, it's Africa's newest independent country. Uh, much of it's desert, a skeleton coast, sand dunes or gravel plains that go right up to the sea. Uh, very rich in minerals, De Beers, the diamond mining company and merchants, they basically run a huge tracks of it. And uh, in addition to diamonds, it's rich in uranium and other minerals. Tourism is a growing, growing part of the scene down there. Fantastic country, from my experience, very safe. Uh, the main town on the coast, from a tourism point of view, is Swakamund which is it's about a four to five hour drive from Windhoek, the capital, which is inland in the mountains, or a very short flight. The town itself is absolutely not what you'd expect to see in Africa. It's very European, particularly German. The German influence, even though the, you know, they were there running the country for barely a couple of decades, is, is everywhere in the design of the buildings, the names... Uh, they got all these lovely German pastry shops, patisseries. You know, you can't escape from the, the German influence there. It's a beautiful, from my experience, safe, very clean, very nice little town to, to spend time. One thing Namibia isn't, which a lot of people can't get their head around, it's even though it's on the skeleton coast, it's not a beach destination from a tourism point of view. The reason the sharks are there are because... The cold Benguela current comes up in a northeasterly direction from the Antarctic, bringing up cool, cold, nutrient-rich waters that sort of support the whole marine food chain. That's why that area has such a massive population of apex predators as it has. As a result, the water is very cold. Even though you're fishing on the edge of one of the driest, hottest deserts, in, in the in the world, the Namib, some mornings in particular, you get a mist which is formed by the heat from the desert and the cold air coming off the Benguela current, and it can be quite chilly. I mean, quite often you you stood fishing with leggings on and a fleece and a and a cap, and it's chilly. But if you walked half a mile in an easterly direction, i.e., into the desert, midday temperatures well exceed thirty or forty degrees. It's, it really is a very, very strange country. Well worth a visit, and as I say, it's it's got to be the, the most productive shore fishing venue for big fish anywhere in the world. As I say, I took um, quite a few group trips there. Every client on every trip I took came back having caught at least one fish over £100. As you've already mentioned, our actual guide was an amazingly good local angler called Johan Berger. So tell us a little bit more about him. Uh, he's a Namibian by birth. Uh, he actually worked as a policeman based in Cape Town, South Africa. After independence in 1990, he went back to Namibia 
and set up a shore guiding stroke safari business. Over the years I've fished with a great many guides in lots and lots of different places. Lots of good guides, quite a few very good guides. One or two exceptional guides and Johan Berger definitely falls into the latter category. He really is a truly exceptional guide, absolutely professional in everything he does. Totally dedicated to providing the clients with the fishing they've travelled for. Picks you up 8 o'clock in the morning on the dot from your hotel. Drives you up the coast, supplies all the tackle, lunch packs, everything you need is supplied. Everything is a very good standard. I'll give you an example of his dedication. He'd pick you up at 8 o'clock and I think the agreed day was 8 or 9 hours which would mean getting back to Swakamund about 6 o'clock something, 5-6 o'clock in the afternoon. I honestly don't think we ever got back to Swakamund before 6 or 7 o'clock more than 2 or 3 times in all the trips I went there. More often than not we'd be driving back down the desert road 8, 9 o'clock and Johan would be frantically looking for a bit of cell phone signal to ring one of the restaurants in Swakamund and say look I'm going to drop these guys off, there's 9 of them come in, please stay open, don't shut. The biggest problem when we used to have Sundays was getting the man to pack up fishing on the beach and come away. He saw one more fish, one more fish. On a couple of occasions we'd be fishing 50, 60 miles north of Swakatmund. Fishing would be slow. 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Most guides, if they turned around and said, look, let's call it a day, you know, we've got an hour and a half drive back to Swakatmund. Nobody would argue. Johan's attitude would be, come on, we'll try another spot. And he wouldn't just try another spot half a mile up the road. It would be nothing for Johan late in the afternoon to drive 40 or 50 miles north, take us to another spot. By the end of the afternoon, early evening, a day had been turned around where people had been struggling to where everybody had caught a hundred pound plus fish. Then we'd be rushing back down for, for dinner late that night. And again, just, um, give you some idea of the productivity of these trips on at least three of the group trips I took there by the end of the first day's fishing every client in that group had already caught their hundred pound plus fish and that was always the ballpark for you know you can you know catch a hundred pound plus fish on the shore it's, it's an achievement for any shore angler certainly for British anglers where catching a 10 pound fish in, in most cases is a is an annual occurrence but you know to do it and get it done on the first day of the trip and then know you've got five more days pressure off to really enjoy it just sort of underlines just how special a destination Namibia is. Because there was 10 of us a second vehicle driven by a safari guide named Danny was also drafted in and what a character he was. Completely humourless and perfect for a good dose of UK mickey taking. Needless to say, the lads on the trip were merciless. As you see, the groups were 9 or 10 so we needed two vehicles, normally a 4x4 minibus and Johan's pickup truck. And we had Danny and another guide called Jens and they were normally the, the second guides which we needed, you know, a party of 9 or 10 clients, they need two guides to look after you. One trip, Danny picked us up from the airport, and he had a bandage around his lower leg. And I said, Danny, what, what, what's happened there? He'd been shot. He'd been filling up with petrol. He'd fallen into an argument with one of the black Namibian locals. I'm not really certain exactly what format the argument took. I've got some ideas. Danny was pretty outspoken when he wanted to be, but he ended up with a bullet in his leg. I remember that bandage covering a huge iodine stain when he first arrived, but after a few dips in the sea helping get the sharks in, the bandage was gone, leaving a big flap of flesh hanging there covered with wet sand on both sides. Obviously, he hadn't embraced the new Namibia too well, which again the other lads soon picked up on. Just to give people a flavour, he was asked what he'd do if his daughter ever brought a black boyfriend home, to which he replied he would shoot both of them. We got there one, one year to fish and Jens was in a bit of a state and it ultimately the story came out when he wasn't helping Johan guide in, Jens was helping out on one of the safari ranches in the interior in Namibia. He was out with a hunting party 
Uh, they saw what they thought was an oryx, shot it, went up to the spot where they thought the oryx was, no sign of an oryx, but they found some pools of blood and a baseball cap. Well, oryx don't generally wear baseball caps, so they had a look around, and sure enough, they, they found a poacher. They took him to hospital, and uh, poor Jens was arrested, and the Namibian justice process took a long, long time, it was well over a year, and it cost him a lot of money and very expensive lawyers, but uh, ultimately he got off, because it was a genuine accident. But um, it's a bit like the Wild West down there. Certainly some of the towns that are not really geared towards European tourists, but towards the South Africans. I mean, Namibia is to South Africa from a fishing perspective, while Ireland or the Channel Islands is to the UK. Lots of South Africans go to fish the skeleton coast in Namibia. They don't stay in nice hotels in Swakopman. They go to Henty's Bay or Walvis Bay. And some of these places, they're a bit like the Wild West. You know, you walk in and everyone turns and looks at you and sort us on the floor and it's a good place. I've never, never had any problems there or really heard of anyone who's had any problems apart from the odd minor theft thing here and there, but um, nothing from people who've acted sensibly. Anyway, back to the fishing. Now we're talking here of steep, sandy surf beaches backed by sand dunes with open desert stretching inland and nothing other than tracks through the desert with those travelling by truck up to 70 miles or more each day to get to good fishing. Then, back again afterwards in the dark without any signpost to pick up on. Really incredible stuff. The Namibian coast, I say the skeleton coast, is a lot more complex when you get to know it than first meets the eye. Basically, it's not all sand dunes. The area south of Swakopman tends to be big rolling sand dunes that roll right down to the to the surf line. From Swakopman north for about 60-70 miles you've got gravel plains and then north of that you start getting into mountains. The mountains stop over a mile from the coast but you know there, there's a distinct change in the 150 miles from Walvis Bay through Swakopman, Entees Bay up to the border with the National Park, 130 miles north of Swakopman. Now basically apart from tracks going to the odd mine or farm or ranch and there are very few few of these you've got one road that sort of runs parallel to the surf line north south and people navigate by saying they're fishing at a certain mile marker for it, and it's mile marker north of Swakopmund so if you're going to fish mile marker 10 you're fishing 10 miles north of Swakopmund up to mile marker 130 Johan, like all good guides, he knew his patch intimately. He had a very, very good and concise grapevine of information. He'd be talking to the other guides and other locals who'd been fishing. And it's like anywhere else in the world. Even though it's a hugely productive coastline, not everywhere produces all of the time. I mean, you're always looking for key features. I wouldn't begin to profess I had any idea of exactly what Johan was looking for or anything like the depth of knowledge like the man has. But his ability to find fish was truly uncanny. And after a few trips, I'd understand that what he's looking for is the actual surf. He's reading the beach in the true sense of the word. He's looking for a precise surf pattern. He wants enough surf to create agitation that's going to you know, dislodge food things, that's going to bring small fish in, and the bigger fish will come in looking for them. He's also looking for the colour of the water, because you don't want clear water, you want just enough tinge of colour in the water, not too much, not too little. And Johan would just drive 50, 60 miles north of Swakopmund, drive down to the beach, stop, look at it for five minutes without saying a word, he'd say yes, he'd say no. If he said no, you drive 10 miles north, you stop at an area that to my eye and most other people's eyes look exactly the same, he'd say yes. We'd fish it, we'd catch fish. On one or two occasions, we'd have a really hot day fishing. Fantastic, you know, really productive days fishing. Uh, one day sticks in mind at an area south of Swakopman called Long Beach. We went there, we had a fantastic afternoon's fishing, 20 or 30 fish, everyone caught fish, big fish. Went back the following day, to my eye, it looked identical. To everyone else's eye, 
It looked exactly the same beach conditions, looked exactly the same as what we left the day before. Johan said no. Everyone sort of looked at him incredulously. Why? He said, no, no, that's wrong. We're not going to catch anything here today. One or two people called his bluff. He said, okay, we'll give it an hour. You won't catch anything. We gave it an hour. We didn't catch anything. Ended up going where he wanted us to go in the first place. Caught fish. But before the shark baits could go in, what we first had to do was catch some bait. And for that, Johan would be looking for a different kind of beach. One of the main baits for bronze whaler sharks on the Skeleton Coast, the liver and gills from a gully shark. And a gully shark is very similar to a, a bull hus, the average much bigger. I mean, you know, the average is probably 20 to 40 pounds, and, you know, you'll, you'll see a 50 pound gully shark most trips. They're caught in areas where there's a lot more structure a lot more flat rock and mussel beds and kelp beds that sort of area and they they sort of spend their time there feeding on crabs and little squat lobsters and things and you normally start off a day's fishing catching a few of those you'd only need one or two possibly three if you had a large group now you'd also catch smooth hounds very similar if not the same species as we get in the in the uk uh, again, the average size would be much bigger. 20 pounders would be far from exceptional. 30 pounders, definitely on the cards. Different types of ray. You get a blue ray, which was like a small eyed ray, but rather than the little white squiggly lines on it, it was this lovely blue. Average 10, 15 pounds. Once we caught a butterfly ray on one of my trips, and that was a fish that was 80 to 100 pounds. Uh, any monster of a thing, I think that's the trip you were on, Phil. And a few other smaller edible species. But that would be the start of the day. Catch your bait. Then Johan would take us to a place that was suitable for shark fishing. As I say, he'd read the beach and find exactly the right conditions. Aside from the wave action, onshore swell and the colour of the water... He'd also want somewhere where the current was running out from the beach, so we'd stake the carcass of the, the bait fish, the gully sharks, on the surf line, where they're getting continually washed by the waves, obviously having to remove the gills and the liver for bait, and then the juice and the scent would be sent out in the current, and normally within an hour, if they were going to work, and usually they did, you'd get the first bronze whaler coming. And that was all before the rods were set up, in the hope of having the sharks already interested as the first baits were going in. Yes. Now a lot of us also took along our own UK beach outfits, though to start with we all tended to use your hands gear, at least until we had a fish or two. Then it was playtime. But unlike ours, his outfits were specifically chosen for the job at hand. The gear that you use, the rods and the reels you use you know, to catch these sharks was specialist. Um, the rods were made usually by a South African company called Perglass. Normally 14 foot one piece rods. The reels would be located low down on the butt. Some of you may know that the off the ground style of casting is also known as South African casting and that's how Johan and the others down there fish. It's off the ground casting. These long rods are absolutely perfect for that. To watch these guys cast is absolutely remarkable. Um, I mean, they'd be throwing out seven, eight ounces of lead, a huge bait, and I'll tell you about the reel in a minute, but not something that's designed for it, and the distance they were hitting were really quite incredible. But yeah, you had your one-piece rod, reel. One of the main reels they used would be a Penn Senator 4 size that had been CT converted, exactly the sort of reel most people would use for conga, these guys would get them and cut the bars off and uh, tune them up so they cast well and load them up with 30 to 40 pound monofilament line and as I just say, cast them distances that defy belief unless you've actually seen it. The end rigs were obviously tied with the sharks in mind. Uh, the hooks weren't particularly huge by shark fishing standards. I suppose they would be something around 6 to 8 o bronzed uh, usually short shank, strong hooks, very sharp. Obviously a wire hook length. And a sinker. Uh, the sinker would be anything between 6 and 10 ounces. Probably half a pound, 8 ounces would be the average. 
and that would be it. Big chunk of bait, lob it out. Stand with your your rod in a the rod butt held in a fighting belt, a butt cap. A seemingly ridiculous amount of drag set on the reel. I mean, the drags would be set. They would be quite painful to pull line off by hand. And then when a fish pick up your bait and, and swam off with it, I mean, it would just pull line as if it was in free spool. All the time you went screaming at you to set the hooks. And generally speaking, that would be within half an hour or so setting up, because sharks would already be swimming within range, attracted by the rubby dubby trail. Sometimes you'd even see the fins at the surface, though with the size of some of those rollers coming in, generally you wouldn't see much, though they were invariably there. Normally, um, I would say half hour to 40 minutes would be the average. You know, obviously, a couple of times we turn and you, you get fish more or less from the first cast immediately. But as an average, you'd see some signs of activity within an hour. If you didn't, nobody would, would be getting twitchy more than, than Johan. Um, and certainly if nothing had started to happen, either sea fish working in the, in the inshore water, you see obviously the classic dorsal fin swimming as the, you know, they're trying to find the source of the, the chum they can smell. It would be within an hour. Any more than that, if nothing happened, you want to be the first one to say, well, I'll pack up and let's go and find somewhere where the fish do want to eat. I wasn't the first person to hook up, thankfully, and by the time my turn came around, I'd already watched how some of the others were struggling and had adapted the strategy to cope. So as much as I wanted to hook one, there was also a certain amount of trepidation there too. With your experience gained over quite a number of these trips, what would you say is the best approach to beat such fish? Well, the best way of tackling them, it's not pretty, but it's called a Botswana walk. And that's basically, once you've hooked up your fish and it's made its first initial run, and the best thing you can do is just stand your ground and let it hurt itself against the clutch setting, is just put the rod over your shoulder and walk in the desert in a easterly direction towards Botswana. Sort of walk a 100 yards and turn and then quickly reel up as much line as you can, rod back over the shoulder, turn, head towards Botswana, and so on. Sometimes with experience and fish up to a couple of hundred pounds, you, you could bully them and get it done pretty quickly using that technique. Especially people who've had a few fish and know how much pressure you can apply on them and know roughly what the fish is going to do. It's like fighting any big fish. You've got to make the fish work. If you don't make the fish work, you're in for a long, long fight. And I've seen fights on numerous occasions extend over three hours and that's a long time to be stood holding a fishing rod. Uh, some people would just stand their ground and keep the rod butt in the fighting belt and just fight the fish in a routine sort of pump and grind way. Personally I think that was pretty much the most tiring, certainly the, the most strenuous on the lower pack. A few of the guys who came on different trips with me subsequently turned up on their second and third trip with belts, the sort of thing you see weightlifters in a gym wear, and, and they certainly help. Others, um, generally those who were not necessarily, you know, probably not the most physically strong of the group, but some of the elder anglers we had would, you know, end up sitting down and basically dig themselves a little hollow in the sand and just spike the fish, but normally when you get to that stage, you're in for a long fight. Every fish is different. Normally you get a couple of long runs and then the fish would settle down and invariably head off in a northerly direction up the beach, which was the way the current was. And if you let it get its second wind and the fight go on for anything more than an hour, you generally be there for quite a bit more, quite a bit longer, working very, very hard. But at the end of the day, they're, they're strong fish, and um, catching 150, 200 pound plus fish on the beach is, is no mean feat. You've got to have the right gear, you will have that, and you've got to have a degree of technique. And you can watch it on the telly, and I can tell you how to do it here, but there's nothing quite like feeling the fish on the end of your rod and understanding how much he's pulling you, and understanding how much you need to pull him to make an impact on him and, and get some line back. But certainly, if you don't work hard in the early 15, 20 minutes of the fight, you can be there for the long haul. As I say, people three hours plus on the verge of tears. <laughs> My boat partner, Dave Devine, was on this trip too, along with his brother John, who wasn't a fisherman, nor was he particularly fit either at that time. 
I still have this mental picture of John with the rod over his shoulder walking up the steep dunes sweating and cursing and making absolutely no headway at all with the first fish he'd hooked. In the end he decided he was going to cut the line, at which stage I stepped in and took over the rod to finish it off. This meant that neither of us could claim the catch, which was a pity really, as it came out of the weight estimation formula at 285 pounds, taking no account of the fact that it was massively fat and probably carrying pups, so probably weighed very much more. You mentioned earlier fish going up to 500 pounds. So what sorts of sizes are realistically on the cards? And what other large shark species might you expect? Personally, I've not caught a really big one. I've had several around the 250, 260 mark. I'm pretty certain I haven't had one 280. Definitely haven't had one 300. I had a guy, uh, Paul Bowen, and he hooked a fish, which I believe was 420, 450. It was a monster of a fish. We landed it at about three and a half, four hours couple of miles up the beach from where it was hooked. Another friend of mine, Roger Gates, went on a, a private trip. I wasn't on that trip. He caught a fish that was over £500. But the average size is around £150. You should get a £100 in a week there. Your target, realistic target, is to get yourself a £200 plus bronze whaler shark from the shore. There's another shark you get down there, generally in the earlier part of the season when the water's cooler, sort of November, December, January, that time of year, when the, the water's still a couple of degrees cooler. It's called a cow shark. Again, it's like a big bullus dogfish looking thing. Horrible shark. No strength at all. As soon as you hook it, the first thing it does, it just comes up on the surface and just writhes and squirms like an eel and a hundred pounder you, you should get it on the beach within 10 minutes but a surprisingly dangerous fish it's the only fish that i would see johan not look scared but you could see the additional respect i mean this is a man who'd be wading out beaching 200 pound plus fish all day every day as if they were nothing just wading up, you know, waist deep and deeper, grabbing them by the tails and dragging them out. But you show him a cow shark, he wouldn't go anywhere near it. And the problem with cow sharks is that you grab them by the tail and they turn completely back on themselves. Never saw it happen, but apparently what they've got a, a tendency to do is sort of lock onto your thigh or your shin. They've got razor sharp teeth and they just twist and just remove huge chunks of muscle. They really are an evil, horrible looking fish. I had those to... I think I had caught two or three of those myself, and the biggest was over 100, 130, 150 pounds. But uh, not a, in any way a, a sport in fish, more of an inconvenience and a point of interest on an occasional day's fishing than anything else. On a number of occasions you'd see five, six, even seven people all hooked up at the same time, frantically passing rods over and under each other to avoid tangles, with the strain on the line singing in the wind. Presumably, that was a regular occurrence. Again, going back to the you know the one trip when you came, I mean, in terms of multiple hookups, I think that was probably the the best. I can remember seeing seven people all hooked up simultaneously, and I'm pretty certain it was on that trip with you. It'd be nothing, you know, once you actually found an area that you were catching sharks in, it'd be absolutely nothing to get two or three or four people hooked up at uh, one time. But Johan um, was very good at managing the situation because... At the end of the day, even though we're all, or most of us would be experienced anglers, we needed Johan and Jens or Danny, you know, to help us handle these things. I mean, you know, the last thing you want is someone to go down and try and handle a 150 pound bronze whaler shark when the biggest thing they've hooked on the beach before is a two pound dogfish. I mean, it's, it's going to end in tears. So Johan would actually manage the situation and, you know, make sure not too many people were hooked up. And when the fishing came that good, if the anglers weren't particularly experienced, he would just make sure that there was as much space as possible between people and people were bringing fish in at a reasonable rate. And it used to work, but as say six or seven people all hooked up, it, it can be a bit chaotic. One other memory which sticks in my mind is Dave Devine, um, the smaller of the two Irish lads whose names I can't now remember, goading each other on into a competition to see who could be the first to catch ten sharks in the day which must be somewhere in the region of £1,500 of fish. I think that was the last day of the trip, and I think that was the best day I ever had. I didn't get the 10. I remember Dave getting his 10, 
but I actually had nine, and um, I'd argue that the reason I didn't get the ten was that I spent so much time photographing everyone else. Plus the fact I think we ran out of traces that day because you get so many bitten off. And again, that, that's another problem, you know, it's uh, that you get in them. Maybe there's too many sharks swimming around because the lines are all going out in the same direction, pretty much parallel to them and look close to the seabed. You got a lot of lines bitten through. So most of the traces you lose are bite offs where the fish has bitten through a line rather than hooked up and broken you off. Very few actually break off in, in that traditional sense. But you can't over big up just how good the fishing in Namibia is. I mean, it's just incredible. You know, you're talking hundreds and hundreds of pounds per fish as an average per day. And thousands of pounds of fish per day. You know, it's, uh, it's pretty spectacular. And I mean, it's such a massive population of fish there. And even though I haven't been there, as I said, for quite a few years now, and I have heard varying reports about the numbers of fish. I mean, there still are a lot of fish there and some huge ones. Ten fish in a day certainly takes some doing, so I'm going to ask the man himself, Dave Devine, just why. It's not as if he hadn't already figured out that it was going to be tough going, so what on earth possessed you to do it? One of the Irish lads suggested it, and it became a competition. It just seemed a good idea at the time. There were lots of sharks about on the day, so anything seemed possible. Not so much hard work as a constant battle. We went pretty much all day without a break, always had something at the end of the line, and it started off as a, a ten fish day, but soon became a thousand pound day. Looking back, I suppose it's satisfying to know that you're one of a very small number of people ever to have had so much fish in a day from a beach, but presumably not something you'd necessarily want to repeat. No, it was something different to try on the day, but once was enough. But you never know. If we go back again, we'll try for the £2,000 day. I take it then you'd go back to fish Namibia again? Yeah, definitely. It's a fantastic place and the fishing is absolutely brilliant. You are nosy stuff, possibly the best guide I fish with anywhere in the world. And do you think that that catch will ever be bettered? I suppose it could be beaten, but it would be hard work. We both had fish on being played for the best part of eight hours. The only way you can possibly go better would be the same number of sharks but all bigger fish. And uh, the biggest fish on my on that particular day was around about £220. Back to the other day now. You mentioned Donkey Bay earlier and on the 1999 trip that was where Johan took us on the very last day. As you say, because of the potential of that place he needed to let people feel their way into the fishing first before taking them to somewhere that was going to test everybody to the max. As I remember it, we motored out to Swak Upman in the opposite direction to the earlier days and with no stop off to catch gully sharks on the way. Instead, we called in at Walvis Bay to buy a load of frozen mackerel. Then it was away down to this big flat beach under a blazing hot sun. The day could not have been more different to anything that had gone before. It was just a fish a chuck and we were just casting out and within within minutes there was another fish on the end of your line. It wasn't always gully sharks you'd use for bait. Mostly you'd be using gully sharks. Sometimes you'd use these mackerel which we used to buy from the, the fish warehouse down in Walvis Bay. Probably two, three pound fish, nice little sort of mini tuners. But little sort of cutlets of those and when the fish were, were thick on the ground as they were in places like Donkey Bay, it was all the bait you needed. And one of the beauties with, with Donkey Bay is that the water is, firstly it's very flat, it's a very comfortable place to fish, but there's also a very steep and well-defined drop-off, perhaps 10 yards from the, the water line. So pretty much everyone could do their own casting. I mean, you know, with, with a bit of practice, most people could cast their baits sufficient to hook their own fish. Whereas the areas further north where you had to be able to whack a bait a fair distance, not many people on their first trip would be up to hitting the distance required using the 14-piece rod and the big bloody conga fishing reel. But it's just a shame because Donkey Bay, apparently, the reason there was such a massive population of shark there was because it was thick with mullet. It used to go back into an area where they, there's like a salt mining area where they you know, produce sea salt and there's a lot of lagoons and reens and backwaters and, and you know perfect mullet country and there was a massive population of mullet and, and they were they were netted out. And the reason Donkey Bay was called Donkey Bay was because apparently the old original 
four by four vehicles. They used to have what they called the donkey gear, and you know, it was the lowest of the lowest of the four wheel drive, whatever it was, on those vehicles. And that's the only thing where that stand any chance at all of getting you through the particularly soft sand in that area. And it's one area where even Johan, with his state the art tote uh, pickup, will be have to stop before we left the main track. Drop the air in the tyres by about 50%. That would be the only way you get enough traction on the soft sand to, to get us to where we needed to go to fish. And even then, on several occasions, we'd get stuck and there'd be everyone out digging and pushing and pulling. And But it would be worth it because it was uh, one hell of a place to fish. Besides all the fish, it also sticks in my mind because not being much of a beach angler, and having the reel at the bottom of the rod, which meant controlling the spool with the left hand instead of the right, which for me was completely alien, you spent a bit of time with me getting my casting up to scratch. Then, I switched to my own UK beach fishing outfit, managed to get the bait out far enough, and within minutes found myself being dragged up the beach by whatever it was that had eaten it. You go on about the gear, I mean, most good quality British built or British designed beach rods, 13 foot, 14 foot, designed for rough ground fishing in the UK, are perfectly suitable for bronze whaler fishing, and they're, they're definitely suitable for catching the edible species and the, the gully sharks. A lot of people on the, on the, these trips used to bring their own gear, and they do absolutely fine with them, and um, the rods are good. The reels are the big, the big problem. You need a big strong reel that's got a huge line capacity. You, you, you've got to have a reel that's going to hold I would say an absolute minimum of four or five hundred yards of 30 pound line and quite often you'd be worrying that you know you, you were going to get stripped and you know one or two occasions I actually saw people stripped on reels that were holding even more line than that. Ideally you want a reel that's going to hold 600 yards, 30, 40 pound monofilament, and for that you're looking at a 4.0 size multiplier that's really designed for wreck fishing or perking or something rather than casting from the shore. Some of the um, state of the art jigging reels that are starting to come on the market now from companies like Shimano and Daiwa, Shimano Trinidad's the Daiwa Saltigas I think they're called, or Salt is, I'm not sure which one. But certainly the Shimano Trinidads, they do a, a size that's big enough and they're built with cast control in them. Uh, they're superbly engineered. They've got the necessary clutch to, to stop the big fish and they've got the inherent strength in the frame to remain intact for more than one fish. But uh, no, from a rod perspective, your average British beach rod is doable out there. But it's, The reel is the problem. In the end, Johan had to send somebody up the beach with a message for me to try to turn the thing and work it back towards where we'd started, which thankfully I managed to do before finally beating it. That fish came out of the weight estimation formula at £212, which highlights the point that none of these fish were actually weighed for reasons of getting them back into the water and away with a minimum of fuss. No, as you say, every fish would be estimated, but it was estimated to a pretty standard formula. I mean... Weighing a fish that's in excess of a hundred pounds from a beach is not really practical, and it's, when you think of it, it's totally unnecessary. The fish were measured, and the standard formula, let me get this right, would be measured for, in centimeters from the tip of the snout, across the back and the back dorsal, down to the point at the root of the tail. There'd be a little flat point just before the tail started to split. And let's say a fish measured 190 centimeters 1.9 meters you would deduct 100 centimeters so that gave 90 centimeters that would equate to 90 kilos 90 kilos is uh, to convert to pounds you multiply by 2.2 so that's 90 times 2 is 180 plus 18 so a 1.9 meter measurement would equate to a fish that's 200 and something pounds. Now obviously there's no factor built into that formula to allow for girth. 
Johan would sometimes look at a fish and nobody has seen more bronze whalers than Johan and say that fish is bigger, that fish is smaller, but normally they'd be they'd be there or thereabouts. But occasionally you get a fish that would come in that would be noticeably fat and then he'd say, Okay, it's come out to two eighteen, I call that fish two thirty. And for me and everyone else who came, you know, that was fine. I mean we weren't gonna argue about the odd pound or two here and there. I mean, if Johan tells me the fish is £230, I don't care if it's £210 or £240. It's a £200 fish I've just caught from the shore. It's a hell of an achievement. And, you know, for everyone who came, that was the standard formula. We all used to use the same formula. All the other South African guides use the same formula. You're all singing from the same hymn book. And uh, whether or not it's accurately within a couple of ounces or a couple of pounds, it doesn't matter. I can also clearly picture Johan following people's lines down into the water with one hand and carrying his long-handled gaff in the other, close to some huge fish just a few feet away from his legs, then being chased back out quickly by some huge breaking roller thundering in and threatening to engulf him. I suppose I got a bit blasé towards it, I haven't done it so many times, but yeah, as you say, a lot of people they just can't get their head around the fact that there's Johan, he's, he, you know, he is wading up the... I've seen him go neck deep and be totally submerged by swell coming in. Yes, he'd carry a gaff, but he, he'd he only gaff the fish in the right place, and every fish was only ever gaffed in the root of the tail and then dragged ashore like that. And I'll talk a bit more about the, the gaffing and landing the fish in a minute, but um, the key thing to remember with these bronze whaler sharks is that they're in cold water. The water there is cold, even when on the days when you haven't got a mist and you know it's sunny and you know you're, you're cooking on the beach. You go in the water, it's chilly. You you wouldn't want to go in there swimming. That as a result has a knock on effect on the metabolism of the, the fish there. They're basically a cold or a temperate water shark. They're not actively chasing their prey. The bronze whalers are in there. They're feeding on fish. They're feeding on lobsters. They're feeding on rays, this sort of thing. They're not like a mako shark or a tiger or a white that are actively hunting and chasing their prey. I mean, I've done quite a bit of uh, surf fishing on the east coast of Africa, in Mozambique in particular, and there the water's considerably warmer. There you've got different species of sharks, such as your black tips, your bull sharks, um, every other sort. I mean, there's whites and tigers and everything else there. There, that I really wouldn't want to put a lot of chum in the water and go in wading like Johan does. I don't think anyone else would either. I think it'd be plain stupid. But uh, the thing with the bronzies is that they're an incredibly powerful shark, but in those particular seas, they're they're quite sedate. It's it's unlikely that when you know when you're in there you know, or anyone else is in there trying to land, when it's going to actively chase after you and bite you. If you do something stupid from inexperience, and again it comes back to your hand managing how many fish that would be hooked up at a time, and you know ensuring that people didn't try and do their own thing with fish. Um, as, as long as you're sensible, um, it, it wouldn't be a problem. But that's how, how how the fish were landed. It would be a gaff through the root of the tail, and pulled up onto the beach, hooks would be removed, quick photo session, back into the water. Every bronze whaler shark that I have personally seen there caught has been released. Quite a few hundred fish I've seen landed down there. I mean, I don't know how many hundred, I mean, it must be well in excess of five, six hundred bronzies. I can remember two fish that I've watched swim off and I thought, you know, you're mortally wounded, and they have fish that have, for whatever reason, they've been ended up, you know, the hooks have cut the gills, and, and that is the exception rather than the rule. Normally they'd be hooked cleanly around the mouth, get them in, release them, so, you know, it's quite a sustainable fishery. And what are the main memories that you've taken away from the place? I think the one fish I'll remember there is the first fish I caught there. Uh, it wasn't the biggest, as I say, it was probably 130, 150 pounds. It was on the very first afternoon's fishing with Clive Gammon. We went there to do something we'd seen a little bit of video footage on. I suppose deep down neither of us really thought it was going to happen, but it was immediate. I mean, we met up with Johan, we went fishing, and for me at the time it was a dream beyond my wildest belief that I was going to go to Namibia and catch a 100 pound plus shark from the shore. 
I mean, short of the stories of the legendary Jack Shine in Clare Island catching poor beagles in the 1950s and 1960s, I never had any idea it was it was doable. But um, that's the fish I remember. It wasn't my biggest one by a long, long shot. But um, I think that's the one fish that sticks with me. But it wasn't only bronze whalers and gully sharks. As you hinted earlier, there were edible species too which some of the lads took days out to try for. In fact, I remember one day a chap stopping his pickup truck with a garrick, which is a sort of a laterally flattened deep-bodied fish, filling the whole back of the truck. I'm sure he said it weighed 42 kilos. Just imagine that in the surf. Well, the edibles are basically the silverfish. The South Africans who I've mentioned travel to Namibia to fish. They're not interested in sharks. I mean, sharks are a nuisance to them. All they're interested in catching a cob, or cobby yellow is, uh, as they're known in Afrikaans. Uh, it's actually a type of drum. It's uh, like a corvina. They get them in uh, North Africa and Southern Europe, Portugal, Southern Spain. This is called a corvina, but it's actually a species of cob. Uh, that being the main one, they'd be steam brass. Another fish called a galloon, which is like a little um, little bream uh, with a rounded face. Average two, three, four pounds. Very, very nice when barbecued. There'd be another one called a black tip. And the one you just mentioned, the Garrick. The Garrick was actually a very rare capture there, because they're more of a warm water fish than the other species, which again have got more of a tolerance towards these chillier sea temperatures, more typically in Namibia. But every now and again you get these plumes of warm water pushing down from Angola, and you, you get these Garrick come down. I only ever saw one. And that was the one that the, I can remember the guy, he'd been out on the lighthouse at the point of Donkey Bay and he caught it and he came back. But um, normally on most group trips we'd have a day when we'd set our stall out specifically for edibles. Normally the fourth or fifth day of the week when everyone's pretty well sharked out and, you know, they've, they've had the conversations with Yoan about, you know, these other fantastic fish. They might have seen a few, they might have picked up a few when we've been catching uh, gully sharks for bait. And we'd sit there and we'd say, OK, Johan, um, let's have a day on the edibles. And um, that was one of the great things, the man. He'd do whatever we wanted to do and uh, he'd supply the bait. Uh, the bait for the edibles would usually be octopus or squid or pilchards. Pilchards were the key bait for the cob. Octopus and squid would be the key bait for the steam brass. Um, there's a bait called a red bait which used to be number one for the galloon, and that's like a like a type of seaweed that grows in clumps, and you cut it open, it'd be like an anemone, and you pull out this chunk of muscly type meat out of the middle of it. Um, I've, I've never seen anything like it before or since. I really don't know if it's uh, a vegetable or a, or an animal, but it was called red bait, and that was the number one bait for the galleon. For the little black tips, you use... Um, like little clams you dig up from the beach. Uh, the whole thing and the whole sort of thing with the group trip was, you know, we'd, we'd have a, a nice meal after the day's fishing and have a chat and, um, you know, decide among ourselves what, we, what the plan was for the next day and the day after, and that's how we do it. But it was, it was a nice change, and um, I think that's the one thing I miss about going to Namibia now. I mean, I, I'm really not that bothered about going back to Namibia and fishing for bronze whaler sharks. I mean, I just honestly feel I've done it. I'm not saying I don't want to do it again, but I wouldn't rush back to fish for bronze whaler sharks. I would, however, and I've actually got plans sort of working with a few friends that we're thinking, that, yeah, we will go back, and we'll we'll go back, and we'll, we'll spend six days fishing for the edibles and, you know, catch some cob and some steam brass and just hook up with Johan again because he became such a very good friend. He, he's still a very good friend. But obviously I haven't been been there for a few years, so I haven't haven't seen him. But I would love to go back and purely fish for edibles. And even when you're fishing for edibles, you, you pick up bronzies, and more often than not, you know, we'd have a day that'd be specified all we're going to do is catch edibles, and then someone would start getting bitten off, and then Johan would put a bait out with a wire trace, and someone would hook a bronzy, and before you knew it, it's back into four or five bronzies hooked up at one time. So back then to my opening statement. In your considered opinion, was this the best beach fishing catch ever made? Definitely. I think the trip you came on, Phil, was the second group trip I took down. 
The first group trip was hugely productive. I had a few other trips after your trip that were hugely productive. The trip you came on in was definitely, I would say, the most productive in terms of the size and numbers of fish caught.